Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron, and uh, with me is Michael Graves. And Michael Graves, you are a newly elected member at large of? Uh, Libertarian Party of Sacramento, okay. Sacramento County. All right. Now, how, how long have you been involved in things libertarian? Uh, yeah, you know, I've been sort of an ideological libertarian for quite a long time now. I'd say about 10 years. Um, I was kind of a Ron Paul libertarian or mm -hmm. Republican at the time when he was doing his primary runs with the Republican Party, um, and I volunteered for the Ron Paul 2012 campaign. I was living in New York City at the time, and they had a really fun uh, call center in Chinatown in New York, and I would go down there after work and mm -hmm. make calls to prospective voters in uh, New Hampshire before the New Hampshire primary in mm -hmm. 2012. Yeah. Um, but as far as involvement with the Libertarian Party as a as a political party, that really only goes back a couple of years, 2020. I was sort of trying to figure out uh, what I wanted my political stance to be during the, the 2020 election mm -hmm. cycle. And that was quite a fun uh, adventure to embark on to finally pull the trigger. You know, I kind of walked in and mm -hmm. um, I was a uh, voting delegate at the Libertarian Party National Convention uh, in 2020 for the in person sitting in Orlando, which was quite a Quite a wild ride, very controversial. Quite a, quite a show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and some, so of the, some of the showiest characters have actually been- Definitely uh, met some interesting at, people. At some, um, at some of the libertarian events in, uh, um, when the vice presidential candidate was doing a lot of road work. Uh, in, oh, yeah. Uh, I think we went to Oakland and, uh, and some very, very interesting people. You're referring to Spike Cohen? Um, Spike, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Spike, he's, yeah. he's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, he's a great speaker. Uh, well, anyway, my name is John Cameron, and my I, I don't have any formal uh, attachment to the Libertarian Party other than the fact that I vote uh, Libertarian. But my, I've been uh, a, a Randite, an objectivist, uh, uh, leading leading up to Libertarianism for whenever I think it was formally called Libertarianism. And my, my books, uh, I write thrillers, have a uh, anti-government uh, bent to them. Uh, first one, uh, Rewire. Um, second one, Rekill, and uh, the, the upcoming one is Aristocracy. And they're available on uh, one of the major, um, we could probably call them the major seller of books on the internet. <laughs> so uh, if you're interested in, in heroes that, that aren't thug policemen uh, ignoring the rules or super soldier FBI agents but are way smarter than any government employee you've ever met, you'll, uh, you'll enjoy the books. That sounds fun. A little pitch there. Yeah, anyway. So we're going to start off with uh, the Biden administration's perpetual search for scapegoats. And, and I think we'll trade back and forth because sure. there's so many uh, instances where he's uh, decided to blame the lunacy that he's been doing on, on or the effects of it on other people. Would right. you like to throw in a couple of examples? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of excuses for the kind of runaway uh, consumer price inflation that we've seen over the past um, year, year and a half or so. Uh, uh, of course, uh, honorable mention goes to Donald Trump, uh, under whom uh, in 2020 the monetary supply expansion began, mm. I have to say. Well, I think it began under... Oh, it's been uh, going. Roosevelt. I mean, but, let's, uh, right, yeah. of course. Well, but but, but yeah, as far as the really, runaway yeah. crazy stuff uh, beginning in 2020, yeah, it's kind of yeah. late Trump uh, going on into the Biden administration. Yeah. They just haven't had any discipline, rain anything in, but they've got tons of excuses. Uh, you know, it's okay, well, you know, everything would have been fine except for this war in Ukraine is mm. making the energy prices go up. Oh, yeah, um, and then not only that, but it's the greedy um, <laughs> uh, greedy oil companies that are, are uh, profiting. Uh, they, yes. have, they have exorbitant excess profits. Um, yeah, that's right. They're, they're, yeah. they're telling them that they are making... Uh, they're charging too much profits, and that's why the prices are so high. Of course, uh, you know any economist worth his salt knows that uh, prices are driven by supply and demand, and it's the profit margin that attracts uh, more supply to come online to bring the prices maybe back down. Hopefully, yeah. if they were allowed to or bring at least level more, them out. more supply on, uh, this is the man who uh, canceled the Keystone Pipeline. This is the man right. who said that he was going to shut down the. Uh, petroleum industry in the, the, the U.S. over the next five to ten years. This is the man uh, who um, believes wholeheartedly in, uh, in uh, 
the, the global warming stuff, believes in, uh, you know, bird choppers, what other people call uh, wind farms, believes in solar. Um, and uh, so that's, that's one example. The other example, uh, let's talk about um, him blaming uh, the Border Patrol people for the problems at the border. Um, right. What else? Him blaming uh, weapons of war for all the shootings, calling the, the AR-15 uh, weapon a weapon of war and said you got to get rid of them because so many people are being killed by them. And I just want to make sure we're not stepping on our own toes. We're going we're gonna to cover that in another show, so uh, we'll just cover it briefly here. Uh, it's worth hearing, hearing this statistic on a couple of shows. Um, um, rifles of all sorts have killed over the last 20 years, um, over the last 20 years combined, yeah. one-tenth of the people that are killed by sharp objects every year. Now, this includes all rifles. This is not just what are, are, are misnamed as uh, uh, assault weapons. Yeah, uh, I, I, right. Yeah. So assault weapons comprise a, a smaller, a smaller number than, than all rifles, of course. And I think the number was something like a, a tenth of a percent mm. um, of all homicides mm. are, mm. are uh, performed yeah. with well, rifles. Anyway, we'll cover that in greater detail because it's going to be fun, folks, to look at it. Uh, and there we could go on and on and on, but I think we're, we're probably about uh, six minutes. Let's, let's look for one more. How about the, the government's uh, blaming the opioid crisis oh, on... Yeah. Uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, when um, right. doctors were uh, required as one of the, uh, I think we might be able to get a comment from off camera here. There's there's a, a treatment, uh, what what do you call it? treatment framework, and doctors have been taught after years and years and years of not addressing the treat pain as part of the uh, mm -hmm. treatment uh, framework that they were supposed to address pain. And then the uh, FDA came out with what they recently uh, uh, what they, they recently said. Oh, oh, oh! Everybody's misunderstood. We didn't tell you not to prescribe these drugs. We we sent out this guidance, and we never meant it to affect cancer patients. So um, the opioid crisis is basically you know created by our government or one of its uh, mm -hmm. independent regulatory agencies, which, by the way, are patently unconstitutional, um, um, created the opioid crisis. And now they're trying to uh, walk backwards out of it. And hopefully now some of my friends who were um, uh, under treatment for cancer will actually uh, finally get effective pain relief. So right. I, uh, I would, I would on and on that. and on. So one, uh, I think, is that enough on this one? We would be beat it up. Well, I'll just to comment it? that the, the opioid crisis. You know, I view that as being uh, one in part a consequence of of putting you know people in bad position, where you have sort of long term economic stagnation. You have uh, uh, you know a lot of money printing, government spending. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's been there's been wage stagnation, mm. and there's there's you know locations where you know people you know th we haven't had like the vibrant you know truly capitalist economy that that you know I think we should have had, mm. and so there's there's been a lack of um, you know contraction of opportunity mm. uh, for you know people who've been laid off and things mm. like that, um, and and they turn to drugs uh, mm. some of them, and especially during what I call the panic demic, which is the government's response to right. uh, a um, you want to call it an epidemic? Yes, lots of folks died. Hardly any children, though, but they want to give them shots. Um, so yeah, opioid uh, use uh, went up tremendously, especially amongst youth, youth during the lockdown, and you could have predicted that alcohol use went up uh, enormously, uh, acts of violence, crime, murders, suicides, all the rest of that. So once yep. again, Biden's administration perpetual search for shape, scapegoats, but... I was told years ago that when you go like this and point your finger to all of our millions of viewers out there, when you're pointing that one finger, three are pointing right back at you. Yeah, so when you when you lock everybody down, you tell people who are who are at little risk uh, of of a severe outcome from from the virus that they can't go to work and and earn you know mm -hmm. a living to support mm -hmm. their family and you know take the take the choice out of their hands. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you you drive people to desperation, and there there has been a, a spike in. Mm -hmm. 
in drug abuse. Desperate times. I think I think uh, this whole country, our whole country, is suffering from kind of a, a, a nationwide depression right now, almost clinical depression. Anyway, we've, we've beat them up enough okay. uh, a little bit. So uh, I, I, uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, uh, public interest law firm out there that's uh, won, I don't know, probably by now 17 Supreme Court cases called Pacific Legal Foundation. I had the great good fortune um, uh, a few years ago to work for them as a development officer. That's a uh, euphemism for fundraiser. <laughs> and uh, brilliant, brilliant attorneys, and and they're taking on a case. Uh, I think it's in Montana, where a couple um, uh, granted, as a kindness, uh, they granted access to um, um, a national park for the sole purposes of access accessing it for logging, uh, which is a you know a thing that uh, when they designed the whole managing national forest, they were supposed to not just suppress fires which they did, but they were also supposed to do very scientific logging, and the principles of it have been known for literally over 100 years, but they didn't do that. But now they're starting to do a little bit of that. So they opened this road up for logging, right. but then what uh, the Forest Service did, I think it was a Forest Service, they put a sign on it that said, uh, public access on private property. So they, they right. uh, turned the, the, the gift from the people uh, to support limited commerce, which is logging, in the national forest to a road that anybody can use. They did, the, the sign does say, private property, please drive slowly. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they just decided to do that. And the, the uh, people that own uh, the road, because this is private property, have repeatedly said, you can't do that, please take your sign down. We have, uh, we have trespassing, we have hunting, we have you know, uh, somebody shot one of the one of the landowners on one of the sides of the roads. A cat. It survived. Yeah, that's uh, wild. And uh, <laughs> that's on and on and on. So you know, it's uh, it's completely okay for the government. To, yeah, and I think there's a, a there's deal, a contract in this case. A deal is my yeah. understanding. So yeah. they they're just totally you know, okay. We're the government. We're gonna you know go way past the bounds of what you agreed to. Yeah. Um, so it's it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so it's I, I guess there's yeah there's this lawsuit. I'm. No surprise, I'm rooting for the private property owners. Well, the, the, you know, the unfortunate thing is that you know, the, um, uh, in courts, most people who become judges um, were, were you know, DAs and prosecutors, not maybe at the, mm -hmm. the level of uh, you know, the federal courts and, and the appeals courts and circuit courts and, and the, well, actually, they are even at that level. Most people who, who uh, become judges, and, and you can't just blame it on the Biden administration, when Trump uh, picked uh, people for judge, federal judgeships, um, and uh, there was a, a huge lean toward people who had worked as prosecutors and DAs and worked on the government side. Mm. And I think only one out of 15 judges or, right. or maybe yeah, they're not less. Picking the, they're not picking the, the private sector has, lawyers has, to work has as the not, judges. Has uh, worked as a public defender or a defense attorney or a public interest attorney or anything like that. So there's a huge bias upon uh, the part of uh, judges to side with the government on everything. Right. And uh, it's, it's well known, and uh, the new Supreme Court Justice, we'll see how she jumps on things, was uh, one of the things in her favor um, is that uh, she worked as a public defender. Um, you know, there are a bunch of things against her. The fact that Biden picked her pretty much means she's probably a socialist or a core, but she hasn't proven herself to be one. We'll have to see how mm -hmm. we'll see how things go. But this bait and switch, uh, this uh, great overreach on the part of the um, the government when it makes a deal with somebody is is uh, more than common. It's it's the the norm rather than the exception, and people are are hundreds of thousands. I don't know what our viewer total is tonight. We, can, we can't see that. I can't see that on the screen because I don't have my glasses on. But our, our, our tons of viewers, our tons of viewers um, uh, need to be aware of that, that when the government makes a deal, it, uh, it changes the terms. And then because it is the government and knows it will win, if it's ever taken to court, first of all, it doesn't let itself go to court. And then when it does go to court, uh, courts are biased in the government's favor. Yeah, and you have to be careful a, when, when dealing with government and government agents. Um, and, and in keeping with that, we'll talk about 
it's a bad year for criminal justice reform at the Supreme Court. Now, right. you would think that um, strict constructionists or constitutionalists would look at uh, the things that the government's doing, especially things that are protected uh, by something called qualified immunity, and side with the people, side with uh, people who are shot by police, who are unlawfully searched by police, but, you know, side with uh, people where, where a DA is uh, hidden exculpatory evidence, Kamala Harris, uh, in murder cases. But unfortunately, in, it, it's not the case, and I don't understand it. I, I have a theory, and this is a weird theory, I have a theory that there, there is so much public, uh, well, there's a lot of public disinterest, but once the public knows about um, qualified immunity, they're aghast. It's basically the same thing the Star Chamber back in, in the old days of the English kings right. where, where um, you know, people who worked for the government were, were exempt from the laws of the common citizens and right. could do whatever they want. Um, but, you know, there's been a couple of cases recently where... Um, you know, a, uh, an agent basically broke into somebody's home and handcuffed them and, and uh, searched them illegally and, and all of the rest of that. I think it was a Border Patrol agent. Mm -hmm. if, uh, right. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I think it's anyway, a, yeah, do you, do you Fourth remember Amendment, enough of it to talk Fourth about Amendment it? violation, a little bit. I mean, it, I think these, these cases that uh, this article is talking about are... That's a Reason article, by the way. Yeah, Reason's reason. a wonderful, wonderful organization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but, it, you know, I think the issue there that they're pointing out, which, which is a pretty serious issue, is um, uh, these are violations of the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. right? These are, these are rights that are supposed to be preserved to the individual that um, really no layer of government has uh, a right to uh, infringe upon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, and they're kind of saying, well, you know, there's, the, there's pretty clear evidence that, you know, at the state level that... Uh, uh, that state agents uh, and, pol and I guess it was bo Border Patrol uh, just totally violated this person's um, Fourth Amendment rights, and the Supreme Court saying, "Well, look, we can't. We don't, don't want to step on anyone's toes. We don't want to. Uh, we we can't even rule on that." Mm. Um, and, which is a that, strange position to take. Yeah. Uh, Since that's their job. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's almost their only legitimate <laughs> job. You know, these other things that they do that you know really aren't authorized in the Constitution, they just run around and do, and then the um, uh, you know protecting the rights that are in the Bill of Rights that's, you know, kind of like, it, you know, that is definitely part of the mission statement and they, you know, it's like you see a case like this and they can't be bothered. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's disappointing. Mm. And I, this, this is my crazy theory. I have a lot of crazy theories that later turn out to be right. I think the Supreme Court is, is uh, uh, trying to force uh, a uh, legislative and executive fix to qualified immunity. Uh, the 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 um, because of uh, star decisis, which is the the term mm -hmm. for precedent, uh, it's very hard. Well, in this case, they actually threw precedent out the window with the border patrol agent and decided right. against yeah. precedent. So, right. they, but yeah, in, there was instead a of yep. instead of uh, you know taking qualified immunity, which was a, uh, made out of whole cloth by the Supreme Court somewhere in the 80s, they just created it and saying it was wrong. Uh, there, I think. Uh, their idea is to force legislative branches in various states and at the federal level to get rid of uh, qualified immunity. Uh, the problem is that that uh, people in government do not want to be held accountable, uh, Joe Biden, uh, and everyone else in government doesn't want to be held accountable. So uh, there's no way the, these people who've worked in government their whole life and run great bureaucracies and handed favor around to these great bu bureaucracies, so the labor unions of these great bureaucracies will give them money so they can get reelected, is going to do anything about it. So, um, yeah. But it's pretty nasty, and if you want to read the, the Reason article, folks out there, just look it up. Uh, bad year for criminal justice reform at the Supreme Court on Reason. Yeah, and, and uh, on the topic of qualified immunity, um, I want to add, so perhaps the, the sort of practice you're talking about might... Mm -hmm might only go back to the 80s. I did a pretty deep dive on this on the topic of um, the, the police mm -hmm. and the tradition of police getting special treatment under the law that, you know, kind of, you know, we're going to side with the police over mm -hmm. the regular citizen. That goes back very, very far mm -hmm. in American tradition, like early 1800s or something mm -hmm. crazy like that. Um, and, you know, it's 
it's really, I don't even know how formalized it is in the legal system, but it's just kind of like, well, this is just how it's always been done. Always. Um, it, always, a, yeah. A wink and, so and a nod if a cop does something wrong. But it's basically, it's, the, uh, yeah, citizen, the cops are on, that's, you know, that's it's, it's this dirty thing, you know. I once referred uh, to, uh, recently, the, um, the court system as a political institution, and I, I think that it is because it's government um, funded, and mm -hmm. you don't have any choice. They kind of have sovereignty. Uh, over what happens to you, and that's sort of the problem, is that it's, uh, you know, they're sort of same team, and the little guy, the, you know, the com common citizen is not on their team, and so when push comes to shove, they're going to give the, the police the benefit of the doubt, even in cases where it's pretty clear they don't deserve the benefit of the mm. doubt, mm. Uh, and this leads to these grotesque outcomes. Mm. And if, uh, to our, to our uh, many uh, viewers out there, if you're not uh, familiar with qualified immunity, uh, just do a uh, duck, duck, go search of uh, qualified immunity um, so you get a, a fairly even-handed treatment of it. And you can see literally hundreds of cases where cops have done and DAs have done and government agents have done and the FBI has done horrible, despicable, immoral acts, and the court has said they can't be touched. Right. Uh, and uh, don't do it if you have a queasy stomach. <laughs> don't do it if you need to drive. Don't do it if you need to take care of a, a kid because it's going to yeah, make you angry. Yeah, some of this stuff angry. is disgusting. It's going to make it, you angry and disgusted. Yeah, now, just clear documented talk. cases of just abuse, including physical abuse, and uh, you know, sometimes people end up mm -hmm. dead and, and you know, people just walk away from it. And, walk oh, away. Yeah, no, walk away. No harm, no the, foul. I mean, uh, Kamala Harris... Uh, hiding exculpatory Arm. evidence that that would have changed the verdict on on some uh, uh, trials that yeah. uh, should have re uh, ended in in the death penalty is an example, yeah, and, and she will never face any kind of no uh, backlash she, at all. People don't even really talk yeah. about that as far as you know mainstream coverage. Mm. Yeah, and so we're going to talk about we're we're going to go on from the evil of government to to the unwitting uh, evil of government called stupidity. And we'll call it the yeah. danger of rent control on display in the Twin Cities. Uh, the Twin mm -hmm. Cities, uh, are, are, there's a, a river, the Mississippi River, that divides, I think, correct me on my geography, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul Twin Cities. Many bridges. Uh, and uh, one of the cities decided to, a, a uh, socialist, a uh, self-admitted socialist, uh, was it the mayor? Yes. Um, decided that rent control was absolutely necessary uh, for the good of the people, that people uh, couldn't afford to live, and people of, uh, um, um, people of marginal groups, people without jobs, people with mental health issues, all the rest of that needed affordable housing. So they decided to institute um, rent control. Right. And once rent control was uh, initiated in St. Paul, uh, construction of uh, multi-family housing ceased, ceased, not 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 right. dropped, but stopped. On the other side of the river, despite the fact that that uh, uh, Minneapolis, Minneapolis, yeah, um, uh, has passed such an ordinance because they want to be as stupid as St. Paul. <laughs> um, they haven't they haven't uh, implemented it yet. They've seen a 61 percent increase in construction of multifamily housing. Right. And when the the brilliant I think it's the mayor. Do you remember? Was it I'm the not mayor? Sure. Yeah. Uh, a self about socialist was was asked about. Um, you know, she was put on the spot by somebody, a, a good reporter, asked her a question. So wh why do you believe in socialism? Um, if so, you must have one example of where in history <laughs> a country, a city, a place where socialism has worked. Would you give me that example? Well, and like and <laughs> uh, hold on folks, my too smart phone has turned itself on. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm not a digital native. I apologize. Uh, so uh, she could give no example, but said she, that she just knew in her heart that, that it was the right thing to do. And ask again uh, to give an example where uh, shortages in housing uh, have not occurred when rent control was put into place. There are uh, places where basically landlords chose to burn their buildings down right. 
uh, so famously. that they could sell them for something else. And there, do you remember where this was? Was that in Brooklyn? Uh, yeah, it uh, might have been the Bronx, but the yeah, Bronx. New, New York City. The Bronx. In the Bronx. Yep. 97% of, of multifamily housing in the Bronx at one time uh, ended up being either abandoned or burned to the ground because they couldn't increase rents right. and they couldn't uh, cover yep. the costs because taxes go up, maintenance goes up, uh, everything goes up, but you couldn't charge any more rent. So there are no examples. There's a great quote, and I wish I had written it down for the show, and I think I'm getting close to time, but I'm not sure. Am I going to get a time check from you or from – okay, we'll find out. All right. I can't see the screen, so I apologize to our thousands of viewers. Um, anyway, I, I can't see that, so uh, I don't have my glasses on. Hold on. Let me see. Still can't see it because of glare. I think that's, that's all right. a four. Yeah. All right. Woo. No, it's a. Uh, okay. It's, it's, like eight. it's an eight. Yeah, we, got some, we got a little time. We got six hours, apparently. Yeah. Wait, that somebody's holding is, up. Uh, Never mind. They'll tell me when it's time to go or else you cut me off. Um, this is exactly what we're talking about when yeah. we say, you know, we incorrigible right-wingers, economic right-wingers, you know, we say that socialism doesn't work. We're referring to exactly this kind of policy, price controls, uh, government control, you know, manipulation and interference mm -hmm. with the market mechanism, the voluntary mechanism that uh, distributes, you know, kind of what's available. Mm -hmm. um, when you impose a price ceiling, you create shortages. That's kind of Econ 101. Mm. Uh, and you, it's the same kind of, issue as with this uh, you know oil and gas issue we were talking about earlier where okay well we're gonna we're gonna get rid of those evil profits and then okay well now no one wants to work on it and we're gonna have less oil and gas yeah, right we're gonna and make it precisely... hard for you to drill out of the ground we're not going to promise you that you're going to actually uh, refine oil or drill for oil but we want you to bring us more oil now because we oops we need it it doesn't yeah. make any sense it's not how None people makes work people respond to incentives uh, and the issue is that if you want to help people with Housing, which admittedly is, you know, it's getting more expensive. Uh, price controls are the opposite of the way to do that. That is going to lead to less housing being created. When you build less, the person on the margin is the one who gets forced. You know, the most desperate person in the worst situation is the one who gets forced into homelessness. This is this is a horrible outcome. Yeah, literally making people's lives worse. And for, for it's it's just due to economic ignorance. Uh, so no, we this is unconscionable. This is. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, there, What's to be done about it? Quote, you know, educate, educate people. Uh, educate, get rid of rent controls. I mean, there, there are places where, um, I mean, even in Houston, which uh, people say, well, they don't have zoning laws and, and right. all the rest of that. Wait, somebody's uh, giving me a sign. Let's see what it says. <laughs> I don't think, it looks like somebody's giving me the finger, but that can't be the truth. That can't be. We're okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, Houston uh, has low housing prices because it doesn't have a lot of control. San Francisco's nuts, so right. it has huge housing prices. Yep. And New York is, yeah. has some of the same issues, yeah. certainly. San Francisco anyway. is famously like kind of maybe the worst of the bunch. Mm. Well, Seattle, I think, is now, because uh, a lot of people from San Francisco move to Seattle. And well, it looks like the show's uh, over, uh, folks, so I want to thank there. you very much for uh, uh, watching Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much to my guest. Thank you, John. Uh, and uh, we will uh, we will uh, see you again soon. And uh, on that note, make sure you look for uh, Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, you look for uh, Access Sacramento. Thank you, Access Sacramento. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you very much for for making the studio available. 